verses 6 through 8. Starting in verse 6. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. If prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. Let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we pray for this message, Lord. And, and as always, Father, I just pray for Your help. I pray that, that Your Holy Spirit would minister to hearts in here. And Lord, for us to know that as the body of Christ, we all have gifts that come from above. And I pray that, that uh, we're able to come to a deeper understanding of this text, Lord, because we know that every word of the Bible is inspired by You, Lord. And so I pray that You would minister to us and show us the truth and show us exactly what You want us to know today, Father. I pray for every person that's listening to this message, whether they're in the room or they're listening online. Father, minister to their hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So, as we talked about last week, um, today we're going to continue on with this. And this is really a series. Um, and as you can tell in your bulletins, it says, same body, different gifts. But actually, I changed the title to Gifts from Above. Uh, so this is technically the second part um, of the message. And today, what we're going to do is we're going to get into who we are as the body of Christ, which we've already introduced. Um, but today, we're going to more focus on spiritual gifts. Spiritual gifts. So there was a couple of questions that I, I had for us this week. And, and the first question is, is how can we maximize our gifts for the glory of the Lord? You know, if, if you're given something... Don't you want for it to be of maximum capacity? Don't, want, don't you want it to be to where we can, we can make sure that just because we're given something, we don't take it for granted, but we actually say, Lord, you've given this to me now. What can I do to serve you? And that's really what our biggest focus is today. And as a born-again Christian, as the body of Christ, we know that none of this, well, we're not given any of this for our glory. Amen? It's for the glory of the Lord. So there's one, if there's one word that I want for you to really remember today, last week was humility, today is glory. But it's glory for the Lord, it's not for us. Having a spiritual gift doesn't mean that we have a name tag with something written on it that a human gives us, right? It comes from above. It's all for Him. And our job today is to unwrap just what He has given us. Get it? Unwrap a gift? Get it? Okay. We're going to unwrap what He's given us so we can learn how to serve the Lord better and how we can serve each other better. Alright, so what is the goal and the objective of the body of Christ? Is first off for us to want to figure out, okay, Lord, what do you have for me? What is it that I can do to serve you? And knowing, and I want for you all to know this today, what you do for the Lord is actually going to correlate with what you can do for each other because as the body of Christ we're to serve one another so there were a couple of keys that I wrote down today and I would like for you to write these down if you have a piece of paper write these down these are keys that will help us as the body of Christ to actually do these things well in order for us to serve the Lord well, in order for us to serve each other well, in order for us to understand the entire concept of what we are doing, right? So I had a conversation with uh, someone this week, and the conversation pretty much went like this. Well, you could do it. And I said, okay, I could do it. But what if I taught someone else how to do it so that they would learn how to be a... Christian, how to, how to work in their gift about how they could actually come to a point to where the, the Lord could teach them, right? Because see, I could do everything, right? I could pretty much, I mean, I, I'm zealous enough to where uh, 
I could just run around and do everything. And heck, I could film myself. I could play the computer back there. I could do all these different things, right? But that's not how the body of Christ works. See, it's not just a church per se, right? We overuse the word church and we say, well, are you going to come to church on Sunday? Are you just going to come do this? Are you going to come do that? Instead of realizing that we should be like a well-oiled machine. We should be like some a, a body that functions with many members that comes together as one and that is serving the Lord in what we do instead of just being selfish, right? We should all be ready to serve each other in every capacity whatsoever. So the three keys to doing this well, number one is consistency. So just like in a regular job, right, if you're not consistent, you're not, people aren't going to be able to depend on you and you're not going to be able to get very far, right? Number two, discipline. We should be a disciplined body. So the, the Apostle Paul talks about he would, he would uh, beat his body into submission. He talked about how he would do everything he could to make sure that some days he would, well, most days, he would do the things that he didn't really want to do, right? Which means he, there were probably examples of him doing things for others that maybe his selfish nature said, I don't want to do that. But then he would uh, not do things that his flesh wanted to do. Okay, so discipline, and the last one is willingness. So are we willing to serve others, right? You might look around, you might think, well, I don't really know if I want to do it for that person. What did they do to deserve it? But see, that's the thing is that as a Christian, we are to lead by example, and we are to lead knowing that our job now is servants. We are servants. No matter what your gift from above is, we are to know that those three Consistency, discipline, and willingness, the only, those are only a couple, will actually help us be the best body that we can be for the Lord's glory because it's all about His glory. So the sermon title is These Gifts Come From Above, Not From Ourselves. They're divinely distributed. And we're going to get back into verses 6 through 8, but I just want to kind of talk about this. These are divinely distributed from the Holy Spirit, okay? So that the body of the Lord Jesus Christ, as I said earlier, can work like a well oiled machine. A well oiled machine should be a machine that runs so well. To where we have things going on so well that if one person steps out, somebody else steps up. If one person is out, it is just like the Lord said, it's alright. I've got you second and third stringers, right? I've got everything set up and orchestrated to where it doesn't matter if you're not here. Someone else is going to be willing to step up. And in order for us to understand that, we must understand that it's about sacrifice. So the world uses love like crazy, right? Have you ever heard people use the word love a lot? I love pizza. I love ice cream. I love all of these different things. But biblical love is actually self-sacrificial love. It's love that we're willing to do for others no matter if you feel like they're the meanest person that doesn't deserve it, we say, I'm going to serve you. Just like the Lord Jesus, His example in His ministry is this. He would wash His disciples' feet. He went to the cross and died for us. He did all of these different, uh, I don't like using the word things, but things for us so that we would learn His example. So just like last week, what was the word? Anybody remember the word that I said to remember last week? Anybody remember? Anyone? Humility. Remember humility. Okay, so humility is whenever we understand that it's not about us, it's about Him, and then it's about each other. So just the other night, we were at the creek and there was something that just came across my mind. And sometimes whenever things come across your mind, you're like, I need to remember this. I need to write this down. I need to make sure that I remember what the Lord is trying to bring to me. So it's an analogy. And it's a very simple analogy. And this analogy basically says this. So think about this. We all love gifts, right? We all love gifts. We're about to open up a gift for our birthday or for Christmas. 
There's normally two things, and I just came up with these two things, or the Holy Spirit helped me. I'm not really sure how it was orchestrated, but these two things come to our mind. So number one, before you open up a gift, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? What could this gift be, right? Number one would be, what could it be? Before I unwrap it, before I open it up, what could this gift be? And number two is, what am I going to do with it when I figure out what it is? So this should be how our minds work. What gifts do we have and what are we going to do with it in order to give the Lord Jesus the most glory possible? In order for us to understand this, we must understand what we have, what we're given, and what we're going to do with it. And that's what us as the body should know. And we should all have a pretty good understanding of kind of what we're given, whether it be teaching or, or different things, and I'm going to get into this in, in Romans 6, or 12, 6 through 8. So let's go back to Romans chapter 12, verses 6 through 8, and I'm going to read it again. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. Okay, so there are specific words that the Bible uses. Number one, prophecy. And it says, prophecy, in the English Standard Version, in proportion to our faith. Number two talks about service in our serving. And then, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, and the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. So as I said earlier, it's not a badge that we put on to be puffed up with pride, right? Right? Apparently, we see that a lot. We see a lot of people like, man, I, I want to be a deacon. I want to be an elder. Well, are you living a holy life? Do you love the Lord? Do you feel like that's your calling? Or are you just wanting it to tell others that that's what you are? Do you want to preach because you want to tell others that you're a preacher? Or do you want to preach in order to give the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, glory? See, there are different ways, and the only way that we're going to understand these things is by thinking of things spiritually. It's never carnal, which means in the natural. Because, see, the Bible says that we live by faith, not by sight. So it's not what we, what we want others to see. It's actually what we're doing when no one is looking. It's actually the, the moments and times whenever we're with the Lord, and we are seeking to serve Him in a way that we will never, ever tell anyone about it. But that is our intimate relationship with Him. So, in verse 6, it talks about a gift. Alright, so a gift is not something that's earned. Amen? Amen? A gift is freely given. So, what is this gift? It's grace. So, the entire picture of the cross is that grace was freely given to us. And so, imagine this. Imagine that you were sitting here today and you realized that the Lord Jesus Christ went to the cross on Calvary, took your place, took your sins, took your penalty, took your death, took everything so that now you're free to serve Him in the capacity that He's given you to serve Him. Right? I don't know about you, but whenever I finally understood who the Lord was, I said, Lord, what am I not going to do for you? Lord, I will do anything for you. Lord, this is who I want to be, and it is to be your servant. And that should be our hearts. If you know the Lord today, your heart should be, Lord, what can I do for you? And this isn't a works-based salvation. This is a salvation that explains Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, which says we were created unto good works as a workmanship in Christ Jesus so that now we are free to serve Him. Now we know that the entire world is living in in a lie and in deception and they're lost and they don't know how good Jesus is just like a lot of us didn't know. I used to not like to hear His name. But then God's grace poured upon me and I said, Lord, man, You're good. And that's how we should live to know that man, He's good so what are we not going to do for Him? Alright, so the first, the first gift that it talks about here is prophecy. 
And so the only, the, the really the focus that I'm going to focus on prophecy today because there are these big words and these, these big <coughs> theological conversations about prophecy these days. And I'm going to throw these big words at you and you're going to be like, what are you talking about? Mm -hmm. But I'm just going to go ahead and say mm -hmm. that there are big words that people have arguments about. So the first one is cessationism. People say that everything is seized, that everything is gone. And then there are continuationists who believe that things have continued and that we still have new revelation and all this stuff. And I'm not going to get into a theological talk about this, but what I'm going to focus on with prophecy is that someone that has been given the gift of prophecy, and as the verse continues on, in proportion to our faith, is someone that is called to speak in the name of the Lord? Is it someone who has called and knows that they have to get up and talk about the Lord? Who knows that they have been given a gift that is going to continue to build on the foundation that talks about 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 10, that we are to build on the apostles' doctrine that we are to properly exposit the text and break it down so that each and every one of you can be fed in order for us to understand exactly what God has given us we must understand that prophetically if anyone ever gets up and speaks in the name of the Lord Jesus and says thus saith the Lord and it does not correspond with the scripture they are a false prophet okay it's as simple as that 1 John chapter 4 talks about how we must test the spirits, how we must discern the spirits, how we must make sure that we understand who we are in Christ and be led by the Holy Spirit. Because think about this, it's either the Holy Spirit or it's another spirit. The gospel is not very complicated. But what you'll notice with false religions is that it's very confusing it's very complicated. The Apostle Paul said, if I preach, preach anything, it's Christ and Christ crucified. Right? Because it's all about Christ. Okay, so prophecy is simply that it's speaking, it's edifying, it's encouraging. And it's someone that is speaking directly from the Word of God. The second one here is serving and so what does it mean to you to serve in the body? And I threw something in there that I want us to know. Anything you ever do is not for the church. It's not for the church name. It's for the Lord. It's for Him. It's not for me. It's not for, for you to look good around people. It's not for you to look like a, a, a good person in the community. It should be humbly for the Lord. And so serving, and I'm going to read back here, it says... If service in our serving, so you will know the Lord will put it inside of your heart that you should serve. The Lord will put it inside of you to where you now realize that you are called to serve. That you are called to just ask church leadership, hey, I want to serve. And I want to do this because I know that I'm supposed to do something. But it has to be put inside of us. It has to be spiritual. It's never going to be natural. It's not going to be carnal. It's not going to be something that we just kind of want to do so that we can get something from it. It is something that comes from the Holy Spirit Himself. And then it continues on. The one who teaches in teaching. Uh, and so this reminds me every time of 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2. I'm going to read it directly from the Word of God here. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2. And if there is a Scripture that we are to cling on to during this time, it is 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2. Preach the Word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. And I want for you to look at verse 3. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears that will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. See, there are many people, many people, sadly enough, that have itching ears. But the Word of God says 
that whenever we teach, it's both positive and negative, right? In Christ, it's all good, right? Amen? In Christ, it's all good. In Christ, it's, it's all good. But the truth sometimes is going to hurt. And I, I like to think of it as a sanctifying work in our heart to kind of cleanse us and clean us out and purify us. And so he says, in teaching, do it the best that you can. Do it as though you're doing it for the Lord. The one who exhorts in his exhortation. And exhortation really goes along with teaching. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2. It's someone who stands up and calls others to the truth. Calls others to exactly how we should be living. Right? As a Christian, as a born-again Christian, should we be living like the world lives? Or does the Bible say that we're actually aliens in a foreign land? Right? So whenever we realize that we're not to be like the world, we're to be separate. He says, imagine this. And I, was, I showed Albert this the other day. There's a pile of books on the floor. He picks your book up and he sets it over to the side and he says, you're mine. Act different. You're mine. Be set apart. But I also want to encourage us to know that just because we're called separate doesn't mean that we are too good to be with others who might still not know the Lord. We're actually to show them a good, a good example. And we're not to be hypocrites. We are to be those that show the example of Christ. And that's very, very important. So exhortation. And then he says, the one who contributes in generosity... You know, one of the first things that I realized in my Christian walk whenever I was saved is that we are born actually wanting to, to make money, to get, get, get. But one of the first things the Holy Spirit showed me is that you're to give, 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 to help others, to give with a good heart, to give with compassion, to give with generosity, to give in a way that you want to help others. Generosity is a gift that God will give us. And it's so beautiful to see those that have that gift because what is the one thing that the world just craves? Money, right? Money, 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 money. By the way, if you ever hear of any preacher or anyone that comes up and just talks about, I need money, I want all this, run. God will provide I've had so many examples of that God will provide. But generosity, generosity is a gift. The one who leads to lead with zeal. I kind of smile at that one because I have a, a man who calls me every now and then. And he always tells me, he said, don't let your zeal get in the way of your nil. And I tell him, thank you. Because sometimes you can get really zealous. But I will tell you that whenever the Lord gives you something, you go and you do the best that you can with it and you stay on fire and have that fire lit every single day. Because that goes back to the discipline. Every day is a discipline walk. Every day is a walk that we need to make sure that we do everything we can. So to lead with zeal. You know, I pray that we can lead with zeal in this church. I pray that this church is known for their love and their fire and their passion for the Lord Jesus Christ. No matter what anyone else thinks, they can look inside and they can see people during worship time that are just praising the Lord. That they can see that during a Sunday morning or a Monday night or a Tuesday or a Wednesday or a park and pray that we are not ashamed to be telling others about Jesus. That is what we want to be known for. To have that zeal. And the last one is the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. So anything that we do, mercy and compassion for those around us that are suffering, it is so important for the body of Christ to show mercy and compassion. For us to be willing to help and to do it and never expect anything in return but just to do it because we are giving service to the Lord. 
So these are, these are very important for the body of Christ to demonstrate. In order for us to give glory, honor, and praise to the Lord Jesus and His church. And the better that we can know who we are and what the Lord has given us. And so all of these, right? You might sit here and you might have the gift of prophecy. You might have the gift of generosity or exhortation or leadership or uh, serving, any of this stuff. We must know what God has given us. And if you don't know, that's why we need to come together. We need to figure out your gifts. That's why we need to figure out exactly what God has given us so that individually and collectively we can all come together as the body of Christ, having a proper reverence to the God whom we love and serve, right? We should all want to know who we are and want to know what He has given us because that is what it's all about. If y'all would turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and, and uh, this is kind of a, a different, um, a different. It's, it's almost more of a deep dive into the gifts, and I'm not going to really get into this because whenever we get into 1 Corinthians chapter 12, we're going to talk about this more deeply, but I do want to read the text and talk about it just very, very vaguely here. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, starting in verse 4, verses 4 to 11. Now there are a variety of gifts, but the same Spirit. And know that, the same Holy Spirit. And there are uh, varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but the same God who empowered them all and everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. For to one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom and to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the one Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another the ability to distinguish between spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. All of these are empowered by one and the same Spirit who apportions to each one individually as He wills. And so never by anything do, do, we, do we have these naturally, but it's all spiritual. And that should be common sense, but a lot of times we, if we're not careful, we're not looking at every single detail spiritually. Everything spiritually instead of naturally. And this month, this is given by the Holy Spirit to the body of Christ. Because as Christians, we need to make sure that we are constantly, as the body of Christ, constantly looking at things spiritually and not get caught up in things of this world. This world, we live here, but we are to focus on the heavenlies. We are to have our eyes focused on the finisher and perfecter of our faith. And our eyes focused on the fact that we have been taken out of this world. That we are here, but we are not to be so focused on the things of this world, and we are not to be so focused on everything that is going on in this world. Because what, that, what happens with that is we get caught up in emotions. We get caught up in deception. We get caught up in all of these things of the world, and the Bible says that the little G God of this world, of this age, is the devil. So why would you want to be caught up in a world that is actually under the influence of the enemy himself? Right? That should be kind of common sense. But it's important for us to constantly be aware of that. So emotions. And there are two words. And there's one word I mentioned earlier, humility. Living in humility. Living in a way to where we aren't filled with pride. But we know how much we need the Lord. We know how much we need each other. And as a Christian, for us to live in a constant state of forgiveness for those that wrong us. And you know, that's important. That's very important for the body of Christ. For us to know that we might do something to someone else that might offend them. But we need to live in a constant state of forgiveness and knowing that sometimes things are just misunderstood. That sometimes things are just twisted. 
And we can't let our emotions get the best of us because whenever that happens, then we become deceived. Ephesians chapter number 4, verses 11 to 16. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 to 16. And if you'll notice this, uh, starting in verse um, 11, he talks about, the Apostle Paul um, is talking about um, what the church was given. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we attain... To, to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may lo no longer be children. All right, so that's a picture of being on milk, right? And then, and then he transitions over and he says, tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine. You know, I've constantly warned of false doctrine because. It, people get into deception and it's so bad. It is so bad because a believer can be deceived. Not that they're not saved, but they can be deceived. And sometimes people think that you're being like mean or something, but I'm like, dude, I'm just trying to love people by telling them, hey, mm -hmm. get away from this. Because Satan spends so much time in religion and he has his own ministers in pulpits everywhere. Doctrines of demons, the Bible says. By human cunning, and I want to, for you to know, human cunning, I keep saying it needs to be spiritual, not natural. If it's by the human, by our own natural ways, then it's not the way that the Spirit is leading. By craftiness and deceitful schemes, rather speaking the truth in love, and I pray every time that I'm speaking it in love, but I'll tell you that sometimes the Bible will cut at you. We are to grow up in every way into Him. And so our job is to, my job is to feed the body, to equip the saints, for us to come to a knowledge of the Lord, for us to know that every good gift comes from above, for us to know that what the enemy wants is for us to be tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. Grow up in every way into Him who is the head into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint, with which it is equipped. When each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. And picture that. He says to where we can be equipped when each part is working properly, just like the well-oiled machine. And if every part is working properly, the body grows and builds itself up in love. How beautiful is that to know that this body can be built up in love by itself, because God is the one that's doing the work anyway. Anyways, all you have to do is come and to be fed and to be equipped and to grow and to learn and to be surrendered and to be willing to learn and to grow in the knowledge in the, of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because going back the last couple of weeks, Romans chapter 12, verse 1. Romans 12.1 talks about how we are to present ourselves as a living sacrifice. So if we don't present ourselves as a living sacrifice, right? And then Romans 12.3, Romans 12.3 says, For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you not to think of himself more highly. And that's whenever I threw in the word humility. So presenting ourselves as a living sacrifice. And then, knowing that we are not to be prideful, but to be humble and to know where we came from, but to also know where we are, and then to know where we're going, and we should be doing that all as one body. Because I'll tell you right now, the Father is building up something here, and it starts with two words, holiness and surrender. We must live in holiness. We must not be living in sin. And we must know that whenever we surrender and we say, Lord, I give it to you. I've been trying my way for 30 years and I know it's not the best way. And whenever we give it up to Him, whenever we say we're ready to give it to Him, then we can begin to start being the body of Christ the way that He has already designed it. He designed it before the foundation of the world. But I will also tell you, and I said this last week, 
that any time you are seeking to do anything for the Lord Jesus in a way that is worthy of His name, Satan and His people will constantly try to beat you down. They will try to be just cause division, to cause problems, to cause all these things. But that's why we are to have discernment and wisdom and knowledge and to be rooted and grounded in love and in the Word of God. In love and the Word of God. That's so important for us to realize. 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4, verses, only two verses here. Verses 10 and 11. As each has received a gift. So if you're sitting in here today, you have a gift. You have gifts that God has given you. Some of us might have more than others. Some of You might not even know what it is. You might feel like something is pulling on you to do something more, to, to, to want to serve Him in a, in a different way or in a better way. <coughs> but to know that we have gifts. And the Apostle Peter says... Use it to serve one another. So is the gift that you have been given, are you using it to serve one another? Or are we just keeping this to ourselves? As good stewards of God's varied grace, whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God, whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies, in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to Him belongs glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So the Spirit of God empowers us to do works planned beforehand for the glory of the Lord. The Spirit of the Lord will give us exactly what we need. Gifts from above are from the One who is in glory. Okay, so remember this. Gifts from above, as the sermon title is, are from the one who is in glory. Right? In glory. In order for us to show others glory. And in turn, we get to share in the glory. And with all of this, we can continue to build upon the solid rock and firm foundation that is the cornerstone and bedrock in our faith. So I want to say that again. Gifts from above are from the One who is in glory. What's His name? Jesus. In order for us to show others glory. Who in here wants to show others this glory? And in turn, we get to share in the whole deal. Imagine this. He chose us as His vessels to share in what He has already done from the very beginning. Does that not blow you away? And we get to share in this. Because it has to be the most amazing honor. And if we work together as a team by denying our plans. Okay, so Christianity, that word is thrown around like crazy, right? But biblical Christianity says we deny our plans. We say, Father, it's Your will. That's right. That's right. And we submit ourselves to the Father's will. And then, at that moment, we begin to see just how beautiful the face of Jesus Christ really is. So I want to close with 2 Corinthians chapter 4. I want for everyone to be involved in this. Who wants to be a part of this? We're not here just to play games. Who's here to play games? I'm here for the Father's will. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1-18. to And so, there are two different titles to this text. And the first one is the light of the Gospel. And the second one is how we are treasures in jars of clay. This chapter is very near and dear to my heart. Therefore, having this ministry by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart. 
but we have renounced disgraceful, underhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's Word, but by the opening statement of the truth, we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience by the side of God. Verse 3, And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers. But I want to stop there and say this. The body of Christ here, those that aren't here today, those that are listening, those in this community, we have the ability because we have light inside of us. A light that shines bright. For others to see Christ in us. And I had a brother this morning that said, don't you want for people to see what we have inside of us and want that? They don't know what it is. But for us to be that light so that others can see that light. And they might not know what it is, but during kind of the moments in my life where the Lord was drawing me to Himself, I didn't know what it was, but I had a... I had a a friend who told me, he said, he said, man, they, they say that the more you put in, the more that you're going to get out. And I said, dude, I'm going all the way. So if there's anything in this life that you were ever going to put full effort into, why wouldn't it be for the one that went to the cross for us? Why wouldn't it be for the one who shed His blood for us? Because there are many people out there that are perishing. It is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the Gospel of the glory of Christ who is the image of God. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ our Lord. How humbling is that? What we proclaim is not of ourselves. Who gets up every Sunday and talks about someone else, huh? Most people want to talk about themselves, don't they? Not me. I just want to talk about Jesus. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Verse 7. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not in us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus. Is your life, does it circle around the death of Jesus? The fact that He died so that we could live. So that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. For we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake so that the life of Jesus may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but life in you. Since we have the same spirit of faith according to what has been written, I believed and so I spoke. We also believe and so we also speak knowing that He who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and bring us with you into His presence, for it is all for your sake, so that as grace extends to more and more people, it may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. So we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, right? Our bodies are wasting away. Our inner self is being renewed day by day for this light Momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that, we've, that are seen, but to the things that are unseen, for the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. And so as Christians, we live by faith, not by sight. We know that every good gift comes from above. We know that coming to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ is believing by faith 
and turning away from our old ways and putting on our new self and walking with Him. And so in this body today, or if you're listening, there are two things. Number one, do you know the Lord Jesus? Do you know Him? If I was to say, you, you could tell me, well, yeah, He died for me on the cross. Or if you, could you say that I have a relationship with Him? He is who I live for. He is who I love the most. Because if there was one thing that changed in my life when I came to Christ, it was the fact that I could tell people that I love Jesus and I would not be ashamed of it. That I could tell people that I used to live that way, but that's no longer who I was. To be completely transparent and say that there are things that I have done that I am not proud of, but to know that He has forgiven me for everything because that is what He will do to your life. And the... I'm going to make three questions. The second one would be this. You might say, well, yeah, I know Him, but man, I, I struggle and I just, I, I just I can't do it. I'm just, I try to be a good person and this and this, and I'm just going to say, live for Him. Surrender yourself to Him. Repent and truly repent of your sins and say, Lord, I turn away from that filthy nature and I want to walk and talk and represent You for the rest of my life. And number three is as the body of Christ, we have a responsibility here and it's a, an amazing opportunity, a mission. A, I had a lady reach out to me yesterday who lives in this town. She works at the post office. And we had a conversation about a few things. And one of the things that stuck out to me is... Well, I'll put it like this. There are a lot of people that they say they know God, right? But what God are they talking about? You either know the God of the Bible, unashamed gospel of Jesus Christ, the true God. Or you don't know anyone. It could be the devil. I don't know. But our duty as the body of Christ for all of us in here is to find out what, what is God calling you to do right now? What is He calling us to do? As the body of Christ in Big Lake, Texas, we are going to be persecuted. We are going to be fought against. We fight not against flesh and blood, but we fight against evil forces and principalities and powers in dark places. And we fight against things that I have seen an attack on this body for the last two years. But I'll tell you one thing. It's happened because God is working. But He has sent me, and I'll tell you right now, he is, I, the last maybe year, it might have been a year back, something like that, I have specifically prayed for men at this church, and He has answered my prayer. I'm praying for women. I'm praying for this body. I'm praying for people that actually want to grow and to be the body and to know that we get to share in the glory. That's the beautiful thing. Don't ever think you're not good enough. Jesus has already told you you're good enough. But now He says walk with me. One of the things about the Gospel is that you have been completely forgiven for everything that you have ever done. But now, He says, just like He did with the lady caught in adultery, right? He drew the line in the sand. But He said, sin no more. He said, now you walk with Me. And you do what I tell you to do. So today, know that every good gift comes from above. We're going to have our uh, response to the Word. And then I have a video that I want to end with um, that, uh, that Brother Miles sent me, and, and I really like it. Uh, it's a very, very good video, and I feel like it will minister to our hearts today. Because sometimes we might wonder, where is God? What, what, where is, what, what's going on here? He's always there. He's always there. He really is. 
But the question is, is, are you seeking what He has for you in your life? Seeking His face. Seeking what He has. And knowing that everything is going to be okay. I say this all in Jesus' name. Amen.